Hi, my name is David Schomer, and in 1988, I started a company with my wife and business partner, Geneva Sullivan, called Espresso Vivace. We started as one cart on Broadway here in Seattle, and we quickly recognized the potential of espresso was not being realized. So off we went to Italy, two research trips, and I've written innumerable articles since then, under which you, I'm going to bore you with tonight. But the point is that we believe that espresso is a culinary art with all the complexity and depth of the tradition of wine, but none of the history. Espresso, to me, is dated to 1947, when the Gaggi Company finally put a spring piston on our espresso machine, and we got pressure. But anyway, that's a long story. You don't want to hear it. What I'm here tonight to do is to explain to you that in 88 we began developing milk art patterns. We started with a, what we call a B&B, &B, <laughs> don't ask me why, and then we went to a heart shape in early 1989. And the milk art drew great attention to the espresso. All we were trying to do was to get people to appreciate the coffee, but it took off on its own. And so uh, finally in 1993 we poured what you probably want me to teach you tonight. We poured a Rosetta latte in ceramic cups. A beautiful, beautiful thing and we'll show you that tonight. But in the meantime, I want to tell you the steps that we're going to take you through to teach you how to texture milk perfectly and pour a Rosetta latte at your bar. We're going to start out with my theory of milk steaming complete with a graphical explanation. The basis of this will be explained in detail, but there's time to stretch the milk and there's time to roll the milk. And these have to do with the temperature of the milk. Then we're going to look at the steamer dispersal pattern. In other words, what kind of a shape does the steam make when it comes out of the tip of the steamer? We'll look at that in detail and how to clean and maintain your steamer. We're going to look at the pitcher size that should be used depending on the strength of the steamer. Some one-group machines may have a weak steamer. A home machine certainly has a weak steamer. A three-group professional machine has a lot stronger strength, requires a larger pitcher. We're going to look at the various milk textures used for espresso macchiato, cappuccino, cafe latte, things like that. Then we're going to look at the milk varieties. We're going to look at non-fat. How do you handle that? How do you get perfect texture? It's quite different from whole milk. We're going to look in detail at the milk patterns that you should use in paper cups when you have coffee to go. And these are the B&B &B and the heart shape. Then finally, we'll show you exactly how to pour a Rosetta Latte in ceramic cups. And these are the cups I recommend for Rosetta Latte because of the wide mouth. We'll look at exactly how to pour a Rosetta Latte in ceramic cups to finish off. Whenever I teach someone new how to do my milk art patterns, I always start them out with my theory of milk texturing. And I do this because if you have a little bit of theory in your mind, if you know the whys and wherefores, it's a lot easier to understand the information that comes later. So what I'd like to do is to show you a graph. And if you've ever had my coffee or had Vivace coffee from one of my staff and you wondered what is the big secret, what is it that they're doing that makes the milk so smooth? This is it. This is the meat and potatoes of this entire video that I'm going to give you right now. Basically, we start out, and I, I'd like to refer you to a graph. On the horizontal axis, you'll see that we have temperature divided from 45 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit and from 100 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit in a roughly linear manner. Then on the vertical axis, we have volume of milk, because milk does expand when you steam it. What I'd like to, you to notice is that between 45 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm calling this the stretching zone. 100 degrees is when your fingertips just detect warmth. In other words, you're steaming away, and I like you to put your fingers on the pitcher. I don't like you to use thermometers. And so you just detect warmth. That's about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And then 150 degrees is serving temperature when your fingers can no longer be in contact with the stainless steel because it gets too hot. Boom, you cut it off. The key is that between 45 and 100, you can introduce air. Now, if you look at the little graphical representation of a pitcher, you'll see that the steamer is located close to the top of the milk. What you're doing is you're lowering the pitcher imperceptibly, so the steamer is going making a little hissing sound and introducing air into the milk. But the critical part is that when it reaches 100 or skin temperature or just warm, however you want to call it, you've got to submerge the steamer move it to one side so that you get a clockwise roll established. This literally whips the milk. It gets all the big bubbles out, gives you the micro bubble structure that gives you perfect milk texture. So the milk is cold. 
We introduce air, we stretch. And this is very subtle, you don't stretch much. Now it's warm and we roll. You can see the clockwise motion start, which gives you the beautiful texture. This is the big secret. You roll it clockwise till the milk is textured. Properly textured milk should have no big bubbles. When it's finished, it should look like white chrome. This is perfect for cappuccino. You see the texture? Very little visible bubbles. And always wipe and clear your steamer or you can ruin your boilers. You can't do the milk patterns without getting this texture perfect and this graphical representation will prepare your mind to understand real thoroughly so you can practice at your bar. When it's cool to the touch, you can stretch, you can introduce a little bit of air, and you've got to practice this. This is not easy at first. And then, when it's warm, you've got to submerge the steamer by raising the pitcher, get the milk to roll in a clockwise direction, and literally whip it, get all the big bubbles out, and create the micro bubble lattice that gives you perfect texture. This is the big secret. There you got it. So this next section, we're going to deal with the very tip of your steamer wand. What I'm holding is a four-hold steamer tip off my machine. And my point is that I've never been able to get good texture with less than four holes in the tip. Six is fine. Three does not work. I don't know why. Now I'd like to show you the steam pattern that comes out of a four-hole. You need a nice fan shape, such as this. If it's too narrow or too wide, it's hard to get the milk to roll properly. So let's take a minute to talk about the shape and size of pitchers that will best give you a chance to do perfect latte art. On the counter, we have a one liter pitcher with spout. We have a half a liter and a quarter liter. Now in our demonstration, we used the one liter, and as you can see, the milk was rolling up to the very top of the pitcher, but was not forced out by the action of steaming. On my half liter pitcher, if I use the same power steamer, I can control the steam pressure, I can be very careful, I'll still get away with a pitcher this size without the milk literally exploding out of the pitcher. But if I used a quarter liter pitcher, something you might want to use on a home machine, I'll see the milk literally fly out of the pitcher. There's no way to get the rolling. So the key is that your pitcher has to be big enough to match the strength of the steamer to get a good roll, but not so large like a big bucket that you couldn't get the whole volume rolling. So one critical element to the pitcher shape is the spout. I've never been able to get cafe latte art to work right without the pitcher having a pronounced spout on it. An example of a pitcher that doesn't work these babies. The shape is wrong, the milk tends to not roll properly in the bell shape. As you can see, it has no spout to assist me to draw on top of the espresso. So it is very useful to talk about the Italian tradition of Northern Italy, how it relates to the traditions here in Seattle and in the United States. In northern Italy, you would have a very small cup, about a three ounce, three and a half ounce. Of course, it would be metric, but equivalent to a three and a half ounce cup, which would be used for espresso or espresso macchiato. You would have the cappuccino cup at about seven ounces. And here in Seattle, we have the cafe latte, which is about a 12 ounce cup. To steam the cafe latte and get perfect texture, I'm using a one liter pitcher. I use a one liter pitcher so that I can steam a larger quantity of milk and get a very dense milk foam suitable for the rosette patterns. I use a smaller pitcher for the Italian cappuccino and Italian espresso macchiato so that I can get a thicker, heavier foam using less milk suitable for these menu items. So let's look at how they look in the cup. Espresso macchiato simply means espresso marked with milk. I'm using my thickest possible texture. I don't pay a lot of attention to the pattern I get on the top. The macchiato features espresso, not latte art. Moving on to Italian cappuccino. In Italy, cappuccino just means steamed milk with espresso. Trying to get a very thick and heavy texture, perhaps a little lighter 
than I would use for macchiato, generally served in Italy in about a seven ounce cup. Moving on to Seattle's cafe latte. I'm going to pour cafe latte in the 12 ounce ceramic cup that you see there. The cafe latte texture is going to be a little bit finer. It's going to be a little bit more liquid so I can get the very precise delineation that the Rosetta latte requires. Cafe latte is very popular. I usually serve it with a triple shot in it, make sure it's nice and strong, following the recipes of Northern Italy as closely as possible while giving Seattleites what they want, a big cup. So this is how the tradition relates to the traditions of Northern Italy. Now the steaming technique, when I say stretching, what I'm really doing is I'm putting the steamer in the top of the milk and moving almost imperceptibly down with the pitcher. So it requires a very steady hand, has a very steep, what I would like to call a steep learning curve. At first it's almost impossible, but after you know it, it's like walking. It's quite natural. You see that I'm rolling the milk, not allowing the surface to break after it's warm. If you break the surface after it's warm, you get big bubble and you can't get it back out. It's a one-time shot. Now, the various milks are half and half cream, whole milk, and non-fat. The heavier the milk, the like half and half cream with more milk fat requires more stretching. This is non-fat milk, considered to be the most challenging. My stretching phase only goes to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Then I begin rolling and I concentrate very hard on not breaking the surface. What non-fat wants to do is to fluff up on you. It's real light. And then you must keep it moving in the pitcher until you combine it with espresso. So after I'm done steaming, I may stir, try to combine with espresso at the moment the espresso is done. So let's make a shot of coffee. Let the dirty water out. Grind it by the cup. Pack with about 40 pounds pressure. Preheat the group a little. Close up. Okay, so to pour a B&B &B latte, you pour against the back of the cup using a heavier milk foam than required for the Rosetta latte, just a little bit heavier foam. This was discovered in 1988 by Sarah Hunting. She was pouring against the back of the cup, and we got this, which is really the creator of all the patterns to follow, a simple B&B, &B, a sort of a V-like shape, by pouring against the back of the cup. Next, in 89, we came up with a heart, you do this by carefully tilting the to-go cup, pouring the milk down the side so that you do not disturb the crema. You're trying to pour very carefully, but uh, not too slowly, or you'll pour the liquid milk out from under the foamy milk. It's kind of tricky. Just as you get about an inch from the top, you give a little shake, the white comes out, you follow through it, and you get an easy heart. This is not too challenging and really looks nice for the customers. Again, these cups, the to-go cups feature B and B or the heart. So we're, we're we're pouring one day and a bus goes by, shakes the whole cart. We get these concentric rings around the heart and we go, hey, and something's going on here. Lisa Parsons uh, works my Broadway bar is the master of this pattern, the concentric rings around a heart within. This is the generator for the Rosetta latte to come. So what I'm calling the Rosetta latte actually originated in Italy over the years as the leaf, but in Italy they're making a very soft, luxurious cappuccino foam. And we make what I call HD foam, high-definition foam, and achieve these very crisp, beautiful pointed leaves. 
But over the years I've been plagued with how to teach this. It's really nonverbal information. So I've broken it down into sections. We begin by focusing on pouring the background. And so you'll be looking at exactly my pouring speed and angle. Then we look at the forming of the petals, the stem, and the rest of the design in a couple of variations. So to start, pay particular attention to how fast I'm pouring the milk out and where it's entering the coffee. I start towards the back of the cup, tilted. As I flatten out, I pour faster, and I finish up in the center and follow through. So making this background is your first step. Practice this until you get it. Tilt the cup up, pour slow in the beginning, speed the pour up as the cup is leveled out, and finish off in the middle with a very high flow rate, and pour straight through to the back, Get, just practice this over and over until you can do exactly that. Then you're ready to attempt a rosetta of your own. So it starts out by tilting the cup. The tilting of the cup and sneaking the, co or the milk in under the coffee is responsible for color density. In other words, how much of the beautiful red-brown will you preserve in the image? So I, when I tilt it, I pour slow. And as I level out, I want to pour the foam off the top, and I pour towards the middle. So to get color density, I sneak the milk in under the crema until I actually form the flower. When the cup is about half full, and I'm beginning to level it out, I accelerate. I pour the milk faster to pour the foam off of the top. And at the same time, I begin the gentle side-to-side -side motion that forms the beautiful flower petals. And this side-to-side -side motion is the real crux of this video and is quite difficult to teach. What I'm doing is actually throwing the milk foam from one side to the other side. There's a momentary pause, if you will, too quick to actually feel as a pause, but you can feel the milk load the pitcher on the other side and you throw it back. This takes practice and the best way to learn it is simply watching it over and over. So in pouring the rosetta, actually forming the flower, you've got quite a few artistic choices to make. You can use a broad rocking style and make large leaves. You can pause at the top and make the heart on top. Consider that a tulip if you would like. You've got a lot of artistic choices. But what I'd like to, you'd be able to come away from this tape with is a method for learning. So let's analyze a little bit more. Let's look at the stem. When I'm done forming the flower, I've got to reduce the flow rate to a pencil point to make that stem come through without distorting the image. So the best way to really learn this is to understand how relaxed your wrist really has to be to pour these. People tighten up around me in lessons and then they report universally they pour great on the bar. So to learn this, be kind to yourself, image it over and over, and I suggest a nice beer or a glass of wine. Just relax on your bar and start trying to pour these and they'll come out in no time. Okay, so to conclude, I just want to remind people that the Rosetta Latte and pouring a beautiful latte pattern will draw attention to your coffee. The real action is the coffee. To make espresso well, it's very complex, requires the control of a lot of factors, a lot of variables. But either way, if you do a top job and you take thrill, if you, if you have a passion for doing the coffee, you can't lose. If you would uh, rather be a rocket scientist or something like that. If you want to make a million dollars, go to Wall Street, fine. If you want to make coffee, take the time, pour a beautiful cup, and have your customers take the time to sit and enjoy it. And by pouring a Rosetta latte, they're going to be impressed, and they're going to sit and really appreciate the beauty of the coffee, the fact that they have a life wherein they can enjoy a cup of coffee when not everybody does. Thank you very much.